and welcome to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario. Special episode of the History Slam today. We are going to listen to the premiere episode of How We Helped Stories from Eastern Ontario Social Workers. This is a project that I've been working on for the past six or seven months or whatever it's been uh, during COVID time has been hard to keep track of, uh, but I've been working on it for a while with the Eastern branch of the Ontario Association of Social Workers. It's been a lot of fun to trace this group's history, the work that they've done here in Eastern Ontario. And while it is a, a very much a local story, I think a lot of the principles, a lot of the issues that are discussed are national and international, to be honest. So I think there's a lot of relevance to this beyond Eastern Ontario and the national capital region. So I wanted to run it, this premiere episode, the first one that we released, I wanted to run it here on the History Slam to give you a sense of what it's about. Hopefully you'll check it out. But before we listen to it, I wanted to talk a little bit more about what the Eastern Branch is and why this project came together. So I'm very excited to be joined by the, I guess at this point, former president of the Eastern Branch of the Ontario Association of Social Workers, Wendy Burke on. How are you today? And thank you for joining me. I'm just fine. Thank you so much, Sean, for for helping us with this and uh, getting it organized and published. It's been my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun to work on. Uh, it's, you know, I, I had all this archival material. I've had the opportunity to, to meet, not in person, but, you know, over these type of calls, meet a lot of great folks, have some great conversations, but a lot of fun. But let's talk about the Eastern Branch. I, I say former president of the Eastern Branch because, Wendy, could you explain what exactly has gone on with the Eastern Branch of the OASW and, and what it was for approximately the last 90 years we've had a a a social work association in this area however this year starting january 1st we've moved to a different model so the ontario association of social workers is becoming a centralized model so that the services can be provided in a more accessible way throughout the province you know a simple example if there is uh an online education series, then anybody in Ontario can access it as opposed to just the local branch or region that we used to have in the past. So the idea is that this will be, as you say, more accessible to folks. But what was the Eastern branch doing? Like, what was its goal and how did it serve social workers? It's a standalone so- association, and uh, it, you know there's been other ones throughout Ontario, but the Ottawa one had the advantage of being close to the 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 Canadian Association. So it's a voice, a voice for advocacy and social welfare, and to emphasize that social workers are professionals. In the past, there used to be a, a professional social work association, but now it's called the Ontario Association of Social Workers. OASW. Um, it is province wide, and the uh, the activism and organization is limited to Ontario. The majority of the Ontario branch social workers lived in Ottawa, though there was at one time a large group in Cornwall, and our range could be as far north as Pembroke. But we've always been contributors to the national issues, and very much involved in the Canadian Association of Social Workers. So with the the change in the structure from the national, or, or excuse me, from the, the local to the provincial, with the Ontario Association of, of Social Workers, why do the history project now? And, and why try to put this all together? You know, it came to me through the great Tanya Davidson, who's been on this show before, uh, through Carleton. That, that's how we got hooked up and, and initially met. So what, what was the impetus to look into doing a history project? We have such a rich history of social work in, in Eastern Branch, in the Eastern Branch of the OASW. And it will be forgotten if we don't make a record of it. Our belief on the board that has sat for the last couple of years was that if we didn't 
make a point of recording our history, it would disappear. A lot of our bulletins and the other records are on paper and they will be moved into archives. So they're not going to be accessible the way that other materials are today in in this 21st century. So we decided it would be crucial for the future of social work, uh, social welfare, anti-poverty initiatives, initiatives, that in the future we make the history accessible. Our goal is that people that have been involved will be glad to hear that we've put the effort into recording what has come about in the 90 years, but also for future students to know why we even have the groups that we do, the social work groups that we do in Ontario right now. Yeah, and that's one of those things that I have been thinking about in, in working in the on this project and trying to create this thing that is really accessible to a lot of folks because, as you say, once things go in the archives, particularly in this environment as, as we live right now, I do wonder what the future of in-person archival research will be and how it will look as we move forward, uh, given everything that's gone on during the pandemic. And the archive right now, or or part of the archive right now, as we speak, is in my house. Um, (laughs) It it will be sent off to the provincial archives, but that does limit it. It's you have to be in Toronto, you have to go to the sites. Uh, You know, some stuff archivally has been digitized, but in terms of scale, there's no way that archives around the world are going to be able to digitize everything they have at least in a timely manner so you're right creating something that is accessible that people can access pretty easily that was a focus and what we've come up with is through the voices of all the people who i've gotten to speak to some of it is recreated through actors some of the the written material that we've had voiced over and some some older interviews that were done with with social workers. We try to put this all together and create a narrative of what social work in Eastern Ontario has been like and some of the accomplishments of social workers. And it's broken into five parts. It's a five-part series, plus a little trailer. If you want to listen to the trailer, I wouldn't count that as a full part, uh, but I am kind of proud of how, how that one turned <laughs> out, uh, the trailer. So in, in total, you have five or six files uh, five full episodes that are based thematically on the, the things that clearly emerged through this archive that I, I had the, the pleasure of going through over the course of the summer. And the first episode is the question of what is social work, the the education that goes into it, the push for professionalization, as Wendy mentioned, the effort of, of getting the College of Social Work up. Uh, the ep- second episode is all about the people. Who are the people that get into social work? Then we have a discussion of community and building community of social work, how the Eastern Branch facilitated that, fostered a sense of community locally here. And then there is an episode about advocacy and the advocacy work that social workers do. Uh, one of my favorite little anecdotes from that is uh, one, of the, one of the people I got to speak to mentioned that when they went into City Hall here in Ottawa, some city councillors would walk the other direction when they saw them because that's how strong and forceful they were as an advocate. That, that's one of the things that really stands out to me. And then the final one is the social, what are the issues that people were advocating for? So we have discussion of things like anti-poverty, uh, children's rights, uh, things going on in hospitals. Uh, there, that episode includes a lot of discussion of indigenous issues and language as well. So, uh, you know, all these things coming together in these five major themes. And and Wendy, when I presented these themes, it seemed to me, and I'm not a social worker. This is really my first deep foray into the area of social work as as a project and as a research subject. When I presented these five themes, I thought. I'm not sure if this will accurately reflect the world in which these social workers have have worked for throughout their careers. But it seemed to me when I presented it to the group that the themes struck a chord that they do accurately accurately reflect what social work is like. Yes, 
I completely agree with you. It's it, you know, it's such a broad range. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, it really is. You know, <laughs> you know, there's there's social workers working in business and and you know, uh, independently in private practice. Uh, the, the, it, it it's a huge range of active people with the title of social worker. Yeah, and one of my favorite things is in the trailer. Uh, if you if you listen to the trailer, I asked a bunch of people what is social work, and uh, you can sort of hear their answers of what it is because uh, <laughs> it's it, it's something really hard to define. So let's take a listen to the first episode of this five part series. Part one is called "Growing Our Practice: Education, Professionalization, and the Fight for Recognition." So. Here it is, the first episode of How We Helped, stories from Eastern Ontario social workers. Welcome to How We Helped, stories from Eastern Ontario social workers. I'm Sean Graham, and in this five-part series, we will explore the world of social work and hear from the dedicated professionals who serve their communities. In this episode, we ask, what is social work? And how do people become social workers? Following the First World War, there was a strong sense of nationhood across Canada. Many Canadians emerged from the war years with a strong sense of duty. While people mourned the 67,000 Canadians killed and thousands of veterans struggled in their return to civilian life, there was a sense that all the sacrifices and suffering endured during the war had to mean something. For many, that meaning came from joining national clubs and organizations, which sprang up in incredible numbers during the 1920s. These included the Canadian League, the Native Sons of Canada, the Canadian Federation of University Women's Club, and the Canadian Authors Association. According to historian Margaret Prang, all of these were, in some measure, an expression of rising national sentiment. One of these groups was the Canadian Association of Social Workers. Founded in 1926, the association was clear in its purpose. Its constitution stated that, The aims of the association shall be to bring together professional social workers for such cooperative effort as may enable them more effectively to carry out their ideals of service to the community. It was a lofty goal, to be sure especially since what counts as social work is up for debate. When asked, even professional social workers struggle to define it. What is social work? (laughs) That's a marvelous question. Oh, what indeed. What is social work? Yeah, (laughs) that's a $64 question, isn't it? You know, it's it's an odd profession because we don't have any... um, we're sort of generalists in a lot of way with, with a lot of other things happening on. But I think it would be people who are engaged in, uh, in working with individuals. What is social work? It, it's such a, a global concept. I think of social workers, I think of researchers and thinkers, advocates, but caregivers. It's people who care. In all my conversations with social workers, Perhaps my favorite answer to this question came from Anne Seymour, a social worker with over 30 years experience. So for me, social work is definitely an opportunity for individuals who have a passion to want to be able to work with others. I find my role as a social worker is not that we often say we're in the helping profession. I myself like to see myself walking side by side the people that I work with. So essentially we're working together to basically find solutions for whatever the concerns may be. Some of the concerns may be minimal. Other concerns are definitely um, life-threatening concerns in the sense that um, a lot of the people I work with have a desire not to be here and they have thoughts of suicide. So essentially, my role as a social worker is to empower individuals to be the best that they can be. That desire to work with people was just as strong in 1926. And it became one of the central goals of the Canadian Association of Social Workers. The association shall seek to promote professional standards, encourage proper and adequate preparation and training, 
cultivate and inform public opinion which will recognize the professional and technical nature of social work. In 1935, Eastern Ontario became the seventh branch of the National Association. Under the leadership of Bessie Chazelle, the newly formed branch got to work. A small group, the 19 original members hosted discussions and debates on central issues facing social workers in Ottawa. In 1936, they tackled the reorganization of Ottawa's social services, and in the years that followed, they provided support for members working with single mothers, pushing for more recreational facilities, and offering legal aid. During the Second World War, the group even hosted Brooke Claxton, a power broker within the Liberal government at the time. Around the same time, the Army was looking for social workers. Actually, it was 1942, they, the uh, medical corps took in s 10 social workers. Uh, I applied at that time. Catherine Ferguson, who had started her social work career as a volunteer in 1939, she's quick to point out that the 1930s wasn't a great time to be starting a career, which meant she had to volunteer to get a foot in the door, took up the call. I was a fully-fledged officer in the Canadian Women's Army Corps, and I was posted to London, Ontario. Well, there were 10 social workers. My office was my briefcase, which I have over there. I kept my papers in that. I did have a desk and a, an office at Wolseley Barracks, but I also was responsible to the CWAC staff officer at headquarters in downtown London, so I moved back and forth. The main reason why the Army w was compelled to employ social workers was the problem with uh, pregnancies among the s women in the Army. It was decided that they should be removed from the Army as quickly as possible both for their own sake and for the appearance of the army. But there were a lot of other things that needed to be done. We looked after uh, compassionate discharges, finding out what, what the situation was, well, any, any uh, social problems. Officers in the army are responsible for the welfare of their troops. So a social worker in the Army was purely there as a resource to advise them what to do with the situation. After the war and into the 1950s, there was a greater emphasis placed on education. The Veterans Charter passed by the federal government allowed 35,000 returned soldiers to enlist in university. The increased enrollment put schools in a position to add new courses and programs. At the time, social work was not available widely. As the National Association responsible for the profession, the Canadian Association of Social Workers wanted to increase the number of social work programs in post-secondary institutions. In the nation's capital, the Eastern Branch had grown to 82 members by 1950, a number that would double over the decade. Across the city, professional development was important, but early on, it took the form of study groups and policy committees. But it was during the Second World War that the group started to get involved in education. In the early 1940s, it successfully negotiated with Queen's University and Carleton College for credit courses in social work. The culmination of these early efforts came in June 1949, when St. Patrick's College established the School of Social Welfare. St. Patrick's was a graduate school at the University of Ottawa at the time and the program offered a master's degree and quickly earned a national reputation for its high quality. With more students coming to Ottawa to pursue their education, the Eastern Branch grew, and by the late 1960s had 262 members. As the Eastern Branch was growing, there was also a major shift in the educational landscape in Ottawa. The School of Social Welfare became the School of Social Work at Carleton University. Today, the school offers undergraduate, master's, and PhD courses. As part of the program, students can learn about social work policies, social justice, and how to work with a wide variety of people, including families and people struggling with mental health. Having lost its school of social work, the University of Ottawa established its own. With undergraduate courses in French and bilingual courses at the master's and PhD levels. 
With two schools of social work in the city, members of the Eastern Branch have been heavily involved in ensuring the quality of programs and student experience. Ottawa's social workers have provided mentorship and financial support to students. The Eastern Branch has long stressed the importance of being active at the universities and having student membership. For decades, it even had a member on the inside. When the School of Social Work at Carleton was under pressure in the 1990s to increase enrollment, Alan Moscovich, an Eastern Branch member who started in social work as a youth worker, pushed for the program's survival. During my time as a director of the School of Social Work at Carleton University. It was under extreme pressure to survive and I, I guess I'm, my, one of my major accomplishments was helping it not only to survive but to prosper in the years that followed. We not only survived but we redeveloped both the undergraduate and the graduate program and uh, those two programs have run very successfully for the past uh, 20 years and I also set the groundwork for the development of the PhD program which was then picked up by my colleagues subsequently and we now have a function functioning uh, doctoral program as well. The program survived and even grew and today some of the best social work research in the country is done at the School of Social Work all with the support of members of the Eastern Branch. Those who come out of these institutions may have had a top-level education, but they find themselves in a very different regulatory environment than those who came before them. In 1998, Ontario passed the Social Work and Social Service Act. When it received royal assent two years later, it officially established the Ontario College of Social Workers and Social Service Workers. Now, the idea of a provincial college to regulate a profession wasn't new. They had long been in place for doctors and dentists, among others. With a similar purpose, the College of Social Workers and Social Service Workers had 10 core objectives. These included establishing and maintaining qualifications for membership in the college, approving professional education programs, establishing and enforcing professional and ethical standards, and investigating complaints against social workers. The college may not have been front page news across Ontario, but it was the culmination of decades of work, with members of the Eastern Branch being front and center. In 1962, the Ontario Association of Professional Social Workers was incorporated. Four years later, the Eastern Branch joined. This corresponded with a bit of a lull in the activities of the Eastern Branch. In his 1967 annual report, Provincial Association President William Zimmerman wrote that provincial concerns were too remote from Ottawa. There was one issue, though, that would bring everyone together. Professionalization. Social workers have always considered themselves professionals, but there was a push to create a formal professional body. There would be a lot of benefits to this. Members of the public could be assured social workers were qualified. Educational programs could be standardized across the province, ensuring key information was taught to all students. And both clients and workers would have additional protection in cases of wrongdoing. In a report presented at the Eastern Branches meeting in October of 1967, A.A. Silen outlined the benefits of a professional college. Perhaps the question really at issue is whether we are truly concerned with the registration of social workers at the level of professional stature, comparable to that of the physician, psychologist, clergyman, teacher, nurse, etc., with whom we share the task of seeking to bring about change in the condition of disadvantaged society, or whether our hurried and confused movement at this particular time arises from other only half-recognized, half-acknowledged, or explored fears. The position is taken that out of some altruistic stance, some generous, accepting, non-judgmental, non-discriminatory feeling unique to social workers, we must make no or only nominal distinction in establishing registration between workers who have acquired knowledge and skills at different education levels. To do otherwise is to practice some sick kind of intellectual snobbery. 
to manifest, one report states, selfish interests that might, however indirectly, seek to legislate others out of their normal method of earning their living. In what remotely possible way can an association that wishes to ensure the level of its own competence in the small specific area of that great broad sweep of society's crying needs deny the place of the volunteer or the technician or the undergraduate or any other person of goodwill who brings his particular competence to meet some part of this need? We are told that legislation to protect self-interest would not be acceptable to legislators. By what convoluted sense of the imagination can it be in the selfish interest of to wish to establish a corporate body of professional people who seek within the boundaried area of their particular skills the highest level of service in those in need of such help? Having to find boundaries for social workers was important, especially for the public. Take a case in Cornwall in 1971. Three social workers were fired from the local Children's Aid Society. They asked the Eastern Branch for an investigation into what happened. Without a governing body, this fell to the volunteers on the board. At the time, there wasn't a set process for what to do. It was a bad job market and there were fears of reprisal. In considering what steps to take, members of the Eastern Branch stressed that whatever they did, it had to be in the best service of those who social workers help. So ensuring that clients were put first had to be at the center of any investigation. And this remained true throughout the push for professionalization. For the next 30 years, the Eastern Branch was on the front lines of the movement to create a professional body for social workers. Progress was slow, but at each of its meetings, members were optimistic. In his 1981 message, Executive Director Malcolm J. Stewart describes the group's progress and next steps. We must now harness our newly increased strength, determination, and confidence to reverse the issue from the threat of deprofessionalization to the professional confirmation of social work. We have demonstrated that it is possible to establish practice guidelines and standards. We must now develop a mechanism to put them into effect and prove our determination to be professionally accountable. If we have not yet received the blessing of the provincial government to do this through a social work act, we must do it on a voluntary, non-statutory basis. And that's exactly what happened. The next year, the Ontario College of Certified Social Workers was established. It was voluntary, but social workers could now certify themselves in the profession. Because it wasn't mandatory to certify yourself, it was important that the college be seen as legitimate by members of the public. For its part, the Eastern Branch made it a priority to improve the image of social work by making it better known in the Ottawa professional community. Networking with doctors and lawyers in the nation's capital would help locally, but across the province there was some resistance to the idea. In Northern Ontario, for instance, it was difficult to attract social workers to some remote communities. So there was a concern that a provincial college and a requirement to certify would reduce the number of people who could provide services to those who needed the most. Members of the Eastern Branch were sympathetic to these concerns and remained focused on the local situation. For them, it was important that social workers in Ottawa received equitable treatment. Take a job posting for a home case manager with the city in 1991. The call for applicants asked for a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing, occupational therapy, or physiotherapy. Alternatively, a candidate could have a Master of Social Work degree. The implication that a Bachelor of Social Work degree was not on par with a Bachelor of Science degree did not sit well with Beverly McIntosh, the Eastern Branch president at the time. She wrote to the city to demand that social work graduates be treated equally, even encouraging the city to stipulate that any applicant must be in good standing with the Ontario College of Certified Social Workers. For McIntosh, this would not only put social workers on equal ground, but it would also help further legitimize the college. Throughout her tenure as president of the Eastern Branch and in her work at the provincial level, Beverly McIntosh was a champion for the professionalization of social workers. And when she's asked why, she has a very clear response. We wanted the profession to be regulated 
by a college the way other professions were so that the clients are protected. They know what kinds of service, what kinds of expertise that they are going to receive. And they're not just being served by somebody who stuck a shingle out and said, I'm a social worker, I can help. So it was a struggle for years to get the profession of social work regulated at a time when the government was really not looking at regulating the social service part of the helping profession. They regulated nurses, obviously, and physiotherapists, and they even regulated midwives. But trying to get social work regulated as a profession was a, a quite a struggle. And it's certainly something that the Eastern branch fought very hard. Perhaps the case for a professional body was put best by Annabelle Richardson, a member of the Eastern Branch who wrote to Ontario Minister of Health Francis Lincoln in January 1993. She wrote, I touch many lives in subtle but powerful ways. What would happen to all the people with whom I have worked if my level of competence was questionable? For social workers throughout Eastern Ontario, this meant different things on a day-to-day -day level. For some, it didn't change much. Joan Gullen and Marg Nelson. Uh, there was a period, I don't relate it to prior to professionalization. I always felt professional in the sense that uh, I stayed true to the precepts and uh, as they were then. I don't really think that it was very different for us because the Association of Social Workers, called the Professional Association at that time, was actually the Ontario Professional Association, was actually quite active in bringing about the college. And so prior to that, we had a voluntary college. We could voluntarily become part of the college. And those of us who were at the rehab center definitely became part of that if we were qualified, which meant you had to have a master's degree. So uh, we had uh, educational sessions and uh, prepared ourselves you know, through those to be well qualified and keep up our, our educational qualifications. Still for others, it was the culmination of a decades long effort for recognition. As Ontario entered the 21st century, its social workers took their rightful place as certified professionals. I think for us social workers at the coal face, it was important to say that if our clients didn't know that they had some rights, that they were working with somebody who was being held accountable to a code of ethics, then they were receiving a lesser service. So I think finding that balance, which um, when the profession was finally regulated, I think it took a little while for the profession for the other professions to recognize that um, that we did have a, a separate and special skill set to bring to work with clients, work with systems, work with organizations, work it with policy. The struggle for professionalization won't get the same attention as some of the larger societal issues that social workers face, whether that's in a hospital, working with children, working with seniors. But the relentless pursuit of recognition by members of the Eastern Branch for decades has not only improved the quality of service available, but it has greatly improved the ways in which social workers can help. How We Helped is produced by Sean Graham and the Wiscana Group in cooperation with the Eastern Branch of the Ontario Association of Social Workers. Special thanks to Wendy Birkin, Beverly McIntosh, Anne Seymour, Ruth Brown, Lynn Sherwood, and the pioneers of the Ontario Association of Social Workers Eastern Branch. Voiceovers by Jill Amentea and Andrew Austin Baker. Music from bensound.com. Thanks for listening.
So there you have it. That is the first episode of How We Helped, stories from Eastern Ontario social workers. And if you want to listen to the other four episodes, all five episodes are out now. The final episode was released yesterday. You can head on over to howwehelped.wordpress.com. All the episodes are there, or you're already listening to a podcast. So if you go into your podcast app, just search How We Helped. It will be there and you can find all the parts there, including that little trailer. It's it's in the feed. So, uh, Wendy, I, obviously we encourage everybody to go listen to the other four episodes of this. But I'm, I'm curious for you, what do you want people to know? Like, what do you think it's important for folks to know about either the Eastern Branch and or this project in general? I think that uh, it's a legacy. It's a history of 90 years that influenced Canada. There are so many things that could not have happened without the presence of social workers in, uh, as you say, in, in you know, the province, the territory, and the, and the whole country. It's uh, a record of achievements. That's what I see in, in this project. And um, I would really, and, and the board would really like to see this as core course material for social work students or social work education, you know, certainly in, in this uh, province, but elsewhere as well. I think it is a it is a local story in that it is about the Eastern Branch and about what happened in Eastern Ontario. But as I said at the start, there's a universality to these issues and to to what the work that was going on. And you know, hopefully, everyone, if you go listen to the other parts of this, you'll get a sense of that that the issues that were happening in Ottawa and the surrounding area are not unique necessarily to Ottawa. There are certain factors that are specific to being in Ottawa in that you have this local organization that is dealing with a lot of provincial issues and and things with provincial jurisdiction, while at the same time you have the federal government here. So, I mean, there are layers that operate in Ottawa that might be unique, but every community is unique. But everyone across the country, every community does struggle with things like poverty, with abuse, uh, and, and trying to provide the proper safeguards and, and support systems for people. And I think the legacy that I have found and what I hope these episodes co- or what comes across in these episodes is the accomplishment. And, you know, Wendy, you, you mentioned achievement. And I think that's what it is, that working in very difficult circumstances, oftentimes, you know, one of the themes that we could have probably done a whole episode on is funding and or I guess probably <laughs> lack of funding yes. uh, would be a better way to put it. Like, you know, that is something that comes up constantly is advocating for funding and for resources to help people. And the amount that was accomplished and achieved by social workers as demonstrated through these episodes, it's remarkable to me. And uh, hopefully if if younger social workers listen to them or students of social work listen to them, they feel empowered to work as hard as people in the past did and push against those barriers that still exist because a lot of what we have today can be traced back to the work of, of these social workers. And you're right that you don't want those stories to be lost. And my only hope as a historian is that I have done justice to all the work that was done. And, and hopefully, if you go listen to these episodes, you will get a sense of just how remarkable some of these people were who were working in the trenches day in and day out. Thank you so much. You were very pleased with the project and we can't wait till uh, more people have an opportunity to f- hear and, and uh, experience what we went through. Yes. And we, again, encourage everybody to check it out. How we helped dot wordpress.com. If you don't want to listen to the episodes, well, you should, uh, <laughs> but if you don't want to, for whatever reason, or if you just, or if you've listened to them and you want the transcripts, uh, transcripts are also available at howwehelped.wordpress.com. You can find those there and a little more info on the project. And again, how we helped wherever it is you get your podcast. So Wendy Burkon, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. And thank you too. Happy New Year. Yes, same to you. So for everybody out there, thank you for listening. Again, please check out How We Helped. uh, And if you want, you can also head on over to activehistory.ca. You can find all of our past episodes over there. New year, a lot of great new content. 
over there. If you're still Jones and for a year in review, something Aaron boys and I, the year in review, hundred years later, still over there on ActiveHistory.ca. We looked at 1920, all the fun stuff that happened back then. And actually it was kind of fun, uh, particularly compared to 2020. So check that out. Uh, you can also let me know what you want to hear on the show, HistorySlam at gmail.com and head on over to your podcast app, do the likes, the ratings, comments, all that good stuff. Beats the algorithm, helps other people find the show, keeps us going. So thank you for joining us. We'll be back with you again next week. But until then, if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes. Thank you.